following video is a presentation of the Alcohol and Tobacco Tax and Trade Bureau of the United States Department of Treasury. The Alcohol and Tobacco Tax and Trade Bureau, or TTB, regulates and collects the federal tax on alcohol beverages in the United States. One aspect of this regulation is the enforcement of what are known as trade practice laws and regulations, which are designed to promote a level playing field among industry members, as well as to help ensure retailer independence. This video series will explore sections of the trade practice regulations, including Tide House, Exclusive Outlet, Consignment Sales, and Commercial Bribery. In this video, we'll introduce the trade practice rules and the history leading up to the rules, and we'll discuss various related terms every industry member should know. We're presenting this information to help you understand and comply with the laws and regulations that TTB administers. This video does not establish any new or change any existing definitions, interpretations, standards, or procedures regarding those laws and regulations. Also, this presentation may be made obsolete by changes in laws and regulations. For the most current requirements, please consult the applicable laws and regulations which are available at our website, ttb.gov. Throughout the presentation, you'll see references to 27 USC, which stands for Title 27 of the United States Code. That's where the trade practice laws of the Federal Alcohol Administration Act, or FAA Act, are codified. You'll also see references to 27 CFR, which stands for Title 27 of the Code of Federal Regulations, and that's where the Federal Trade Practice Regulations are codified. Now, as you go through the video, please make note of the citations that are made to either 27 USC or 27 CFR. That's where you'll be able to find additional information and the full text of the specific law or regulation cited. Before we discuss the specific trade practices prohibited under the FAA Act, let's look at the law's history and explain some terms you may not know. In the pre-prohibition era, alcohol was blamed for a wide variety of problems, ranging from absenteeism at the workplace to spousal abuse to political corruption. Generally, people blamed the alcohol beverage industry for these problems. One issue seen as contributing to the problem was the practice by alcohol producers and wholesalers of requiring retailers to purchase large quantities of their brands as a condition of carrying the brand at all. This led retailers to push alcohol sales to their customers, which in turn led to excessive consumption. Excessive consumption, people believed, led to social problems. Another problem was that tied houses, or retailers tied to wholesalers and producers, were used to influence elections. For example, saloons supporting a particular candidate gave free drinks on election day to buy or influence votes. The saloons, of course, were subsidized by the alcohol industry. These problems, among many others, led to the era of prohibition with the enactment of the 18th Amendment. In 1919, the Volstead Act, formerly known as the National Prohibition Act, was enacted to provide enforcement for the 18th Amendment, prohibiting the manufacture and sale of alcohol beverages. Prohibition, people believed, was a failed experiment in large part because people still drank alcohol. It was illegal to make alcohol during Prohibition, so only the criminals were doing so. Many of the people involved were not just average street criminals, but were also involved with organized crime. Fifteen years after Prohibition began, it was repealed with the enactment of the 21st Amendment. Still, Congress wanted to avoid the problems that led to and were caused by prohibition. Specifically, they wanted a closely regulated industry, free of certain unfair industry practices and the excess consumption those practices caused. They also wanted to ensure fair competition, keep the criminal element out of the alcohol beverage industry, and protect the consumer. Their solution was to enact the Federal Alcohol Administration Act. The Federal Alcohol Administration Act, or FAA Act as it's commonly called, was signed into law by President Roosevelt in 1935. Its goals were to 
keep the criminal element out of the alcohol industry and maintain compliance by using the permit system, regulate the formulation, labeling, and advertising of alcohol beverages, regulate the promotional and marketing trade practices that might lead to corruption or excessive consumption, which is what our presentation focuses on, and protect the consumer. To accomplish these goals, the FAA Act implements a basic permit requirement, defines and outlaws certain marketing and business or trade practices, and regulates the labeling and advertising of alcohol beverages. Congress can only pass laws related to certain specifically enumerated areas. Although there are two amendments to the Constitution relating to alcohol, neither one provides Congress the specific power to regulate alcohol. Instead, Congress derives its authority to regulate alcohol through its power to tax, and for our purposes here today, to regulate interstate and foreign commerce. The constitutional authority for the FAA Act comes from the Commerce Clause, which provides Congress with the power to regulate commerce within foreign nations and among the several states. This power allows Congress to regulate virtually any activity that affects commerce among two or more states. Accordingly, for the FAA Act to apply, the law includes an interstate commerce requirement. We discuss this element in more detail later in the presentation. Now, consistent with its goal of keeping certain criminals and prohibited entities out of the legal alcohol beverage industry, the FAA Act imposes a basic permit requirement. Under this permit system, with one exception, producers, importers, and wholesalers of alcohol beverages must obtain a basic permit prior to commencing operations. All importers and wholesalers of distilled spirits, wine, and malt beverages must obtain a basic permit before conducting business. Similarly, all producers of distilled spirits and wine must obtain a basic permit before conducting business. Malt beverage producers, or brewers, on the other hand, are not required to have one, but must file a brewer's notice under the Internal Revenue Code before conducting business. Keep in mind that even though brewers are not required to obtain a permit, they cannot violate the laws without penalty. Permits can be revoked, suspended, or annulled for violation of the FAA Act. To regulate promotional and marketing trade practices that might lead to corruption or excessive consumption, the FAA Act imposes restrictions on certain unlawful trade practices. This serves to prevent wholesaler, importer, and producer control over retailers and accompanying corruption and overconsumption, and to help keep a level playing field among industry members. There are four prohibited trade practices for alcohol beverage producers, wholesalers, and importers. Tied house, exclusive outlet, commercial bribery, and consignment sales. Please make sure to watch our additional videos which discuss these four prohibited practices in more detail. But before you do, let's talk about some of the terms we'll be using during the various trade practice presentations. First, an industry member is someone who is engaged in business as a distiller, brewer, rectifier, blender, or other producer, or an importer or wholesaler of distilled spirits, wine, or malt beverages, or a bottler or warehouseman and bottler of distilled spirits. The term industry member does not include any agency of the state or political subdivision. Retailers, those who sell directly to consumers, are also not considered industry members. You'll hear the term trade buyer used during our presentations on commercial bribery and consignment sales. A trade buyer is any person who is a wholesaler or retailer of distilled spirits, wine, or malt beverages. An inducement is anything that persuades or influences someone to do something. Inducements may include money, goods, services, equipment, property, financial assistance, or the like, interest in a license with respect to the premises of a retailer, interest in real or personal property owned, occupied, or used by the retailer in the conduct of a retailer's business, or 
paying for advertising, or display space. Exclusion is an element of proof in exclusive outlet, tied house, and commercial bribery cases. In other words, in order to prove a violation, TTB must show that the prohibited practice resulted in the exclusion of competing products. There are two elements to exclusion, both of which must be proven. First, TTB must prove that the practice places or has the potential to place a retailer's independence at risk by means of a tie or link between the industry member and the retailer, or by any other means of industry member control. Second, TTB must prove that the practice results in the retailer purchasing less of a competitor's product than it otherwise would have. Interstate or foreign commerce is another element of a violation that TTB must prove in all trade practice cases. In general, for exclusive outlet, tied house, and commercial bribery violations, TTB must establish a connection in interstate or foreign commerce through the primary clause and one of the other three jurisdictional clauses in 27 U.S.C. Section 205A through C. The primary clause provides that the excluded competitor's products must be sold or offered for sale in interstate or foreign commerce. Now, since most alcohol beverage products are sold or offered for sale in interstate commerce, this primary clause is generally satisfied in all cases. Since consignment sales violations do not require exclusion as an element of proof, the primary clause does not apply to consignment sales. Now, Let's look at the three jurisdictional clauses. Remember, we just need one of these in addition to the primary clause to establish this element. The first jurisdictional clause applies if the inducement requirement or offer is made in the course of interstate or foreign commerce. This clause is satisfied if the prohibited conduct crosses state lines. For example, if both an industry member and retailer are in Florida, but the money used to induce the retailer comes from corporate headquarters in Nevada, the money will have moved in interstate commerce, satisfying this clause. The second jurisdictional clause applies if such person engages in practices to such an extent as to substantially restrain or prevent transactions in interstate or foreign commerce. For example, this clause would apply if, during the period of a violation, the excluded product moved in interstate or foreign commerce, and the prohibited act causes a retailer not to purchase it. The third and last jurisdictional clause applies if the direct effect of such requirement is to prevent, deter, hinder, or restrict other persons from selling or offering for sale any such products to such retailer in interstate or foreign commerce. This clause requires some degree of direct interference with interstate or foreign commerce. Remember, interstate or foreign commerce is required to establish a violation. This element is generally not difficult for TTB to establish. The second to the last paragraph of 27 U.S.C. Section 205, generally referred to as the penultimate clause, provides that in the case of malt beverages, the trade practice provisions apply to transactions between a retailer or trade buyer in any state and an industry member outside such state only if the retailer's or trade buyer's state law imposes similar requirements for in-state transactions. The penultimate clause was added because during the 1930s when the FAA Act was established, brewers generally sold only in their own state. Congress did not want to subject the relatively few brewers who sold into interstate commerce to more restrictions than their competitors who only sold their products in one state. Because of the penultimate clause, if the prohibited conduct involves malt beverages, there must be a similar state law to enforce the FAA Act trade practices provisions. Similar, of course, does not mean identical. When determining whether the requisite similar state law exists, TTB is guided by the degree of similarity and not whether the federal requirements have been adopted by the state. 
if there is no specific state alcohol beverage law addressing a particular trade practice, TTB looks to other state laws of general applicability, such as business and antitrust laws. TTB applies a broad interpretation of similarity. However, if an activity is explicitly permitted by a state, the TTB trade practice regulations would not prohibit that conduct for activities that involve only malt beverages. Remember, TTB does not have to show a similar state law for practices involving distilled spirits and wines. This means even if the practice is explicitly permitted by the state, it can still violate the FAA Act. If you have any questions about the information in this presentation or activities that may be prohibited, please send an email to tradepractices at ttb.gov. Please make sure to watch our additional videos which discuss the four prohibited practices, Tide House, Exclusive Outlets, Consignment Sales, and Commercial Bribery.